Okay, so some of you, uh, a lot of you, know, I, I know, and I've I've gotten a chance to meet over the last few days, and uh, um, some of you I I don't know, and I'd I'd be really excited if you came up after the talk and uh, we could get to know each other just a little bit, um, because as as much as I know everyone came here to see speakers' pretty faces, I, I know that everyone's really excited about uh, getting a chance to hang out with people, get to get to talk to people, get to make relationships that'll span years and miles, and and for some of us even span oceans. Um, but uh, so this talk, I'm really excited you're here because I'm going to give you all of the secrets that you're going to need. Everything that uh, open source uh, advocates have been hiding from you, I'm going to reveal today. Okay, that might be overselling it a little bit, but you know, hey, we, we, we had good food, we, uh, we've been having a good time, so why not oversell it a little bit? But I'm gonna give you all the secrets that you need to know about open source, about the community, about how to get started both personally and professionally. Um, and, and who am I, to, who am I to, to give this talk? I can tell you that if it weren't for some of the people in this room, and if it weren't for what, what they stood for, what they shared with me, um, if it weren't for the community, I would not be where I am today. I certainly wouldn't be on the stage. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be where I'm at in my career. Um, and I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be as successful personally because when, when you get parts of your life going right, when, when you get your career right, when you have people that you can mentor, when you have people that mentor you, when you get those things in order, your, your life continues to improve. It gets better and better and better. And every year, every month, every day, I'm just more excited and more surprised as to what, what my life has been bringing to me. And a lot of that is due to the reasons why we're here. <clears throat> um, so I am a solutions architect for GitLab. Um, we are a continuous, uh, we're, we are a CI CD uh, uh, development application that spans the entire pipeline. Um, I, I, I've also done some, some guest hosting on, I've also done a lot of uh, guest hosting on some podcasts. I'm looking to start my own here in the near future. And um, I, I'm, I, I'm a lousy gamer, so, uh, but I, I have been pretty addicted to Elder Scrolls lately. Um, and I, I put down open source wizard to, to be facetious, but with the community, I've, I've had the pleasure of working with the GNOME Foundation, with Jupiter Broadcasting, with the Ask Noah Show. Um, I've, I've had the, option, the opportunity to go to conferences like this and, and share my experiences and, and make some friendships. So open source wizard is just facetious for, I, I've gotten the chance to do some really amazing things with some brilliant people. And, and that's kind of what, what, I wanted, what I wanna share with you today. So, who are all of you? Today, I'm hoping to talk to folks that are new to the, new to the community, people that have heard about this, this Linux thing but haven't really gotten to do anything with it. Um, um, maybe there's someone in the audience who's been a longtime IT professional, somebody who makes money off of, off of what they do. Maybe you're a systems administrator or a DBA or, or maybe you work in security, but Maybe you're like me a few years ago, and you just aren't getting the you you aren't getting what you want out of your your career. There's something missing, because that's my story, and that's that's what what inspired this talk. Maybe maybe you don't work in IT at all, and you're looking for a new start. So you you found this someone drug you to this conference and hanging out with all these nerds that talk about penguins and this thing called FOSS, and um, so. This, this, this talk is going to address a wide variety of people. So I really think there's something in this for everyone. And I don't say that because I'm a great speaker. I say that because I've lived this. This is literally what I've gone through over the past four years. So where do you start? Whether you're, you're into your career, whether you're tenured, whether you're just getting started, open source is huge. And when, when I say open source for, for, for my veterans here, I'm, I'm talking about FOSS or open source. I, I'm not, we're not talking about financials here. I, so be it FOSS or open source, make that equivalency with me. So where do you start? The open source community is huge. There's millions of developers, dozens of languages, all types of different positions and roles and responsibilities that you can be a part of. And, and this, this movement is, is global. It stretches, it, it, it ignores color, it ignores gender, it ignores 
anything. It, it is one of the most unbelievable movements that, that mankind has ever seen. And it's really spun up over the last 20 some odd years. So here, here's, here's your first pro tip of the day. If you have a skill, there's a need in open source. If you have something that you can do and do it well, there's a place for you. Because here's, here's one of the biggest misconceptions that I hear. My background is as a systems engineer. I spent almost a decade managing Windows for a few years. Um, and, uh, and after that, I was just a pure Linux systems administrator. So I worked a lot on Red Hat and CentOS servers. And um, I can tell you that open source is not just for developers. That is a misconception. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. So you might be saying, hey, IT guy, I don't, I don't have a skill. I don't know how to do X. Uh, that, that's not really an excuse anymore. There are so many tools out there at your fingertips. If you go out onto the internet, there's, there's organizations like Linux Academy. Linux Academy has grown so much over the last few years because they fill a need. Linux Academy is an online education platform that covers cloud, development, Linux, open source, and they grow every year. Maybe you don't have money for that. Well, <laughs> there's groups like DigitalOcean who host a huge repository of information. There's the Arch Linux Wiki that has tons of information about um, how to install your operating system and how to work with different applications. You can search for blogs. You can search for tutorials and walkthroughs on how to do certain tasks. Listen to these talks, go to the booths, figure out what people are working on, and take that, take that home and search for those keywords. How do I do X? And I can guarantee you, you will find dozens of blogs and walkthroughs and people's histories on how they did that thing. But you can't do this alone. You can't do this on an island. So find a Linux user group. There's lugs in almost every major city, at least here in the US. I know that there's lugs all over the world. There's some that are online. Um, a, a, a shameless plug for, for a colleague of mine. If, if you join uh, Big Daddy Linux Live, that is basically a virtual lug. You can log on via Zoom client. You can talk about Linux. You can share information. So for those of us that travel a lot, those of us that may not have a very active group at home, there are options to do so online. You showed up, Roscoe, you, or Rocco, you showed up, so I gave you a shout out. Big Daddy Linux Live, tonight, live, 8 p.m., shameless plug. In fact, if, if, you're, if you don't have the technical experience to get started in open source, in fact, one of my checkpoints, you're already doing. You attended a conference. You're here. Congratulations. Or you're watching online. Thank you all so much for those of you that are watching online, because you're just an extension of our family here. You can also search for boot camps. There's development boot camps. There's, there's, there's boot camps which are you know, four or five days of just very deep, very heavy learning. And it's a great way to just get started, get in deep, just dive in head first and see if you like something. So one of the best ways to learn is not to just learn in a vacuum. Learning, on, learning how to write Hello World in three different languages is great. It's, it's great skill, it's great achievement. But you're not going to really learn, you're not really going to commit that to memory unless you do something yourself. One of the best things to do, build your own server lab. You can, you can buy a desktop, install a server operating system on it, call that your lab. You can spin up virtual machines on your laptop or on, or on your desktop. Or if you're a little bit obsessive like myself, there are sites out there like, uh, like Server Monkey and Unix Surplus. They Companies will lease brand new hardware for three or four years, and then companies like ServerMonkey or Unix Surplus will buy this hardware, will refurbish it, and resell it for pennies on the dollar. I just bought a Dell R520. It's now sitting in a colo and home. It came in, I installed the operating system, and dropped it off the day before I came to self. So I'm really excited to go home and play with that. <laughs> if you don't want to jack with hardware, that's fine. DigitalOcean, Linode, AWS, these cloud providers actually give you very, very cheap server operating systems where you can, you can sharpen your system administrator skills. You can install a Python environment. You can install Ruby on Rails and start doing development. They, 
they have they have starter credits. Some of the uh, some of the organizations that are here have additional coupons or promo codes that you can get. So you can get some of them offer hundred dollars of free credit. In today's day and age, you do not have an excuse to not have a do-it-yourself project. In fact, I, I learned this the hard way. It took me years before I actually set up a server at home. One of the problems I had was, where do I start? So I have this server. It does nothing but sit there and idle and bring my power bill up. <laughs> Those of us that have small server clusters at home, we know how that feels. <laughs> so here's, here's just a couple of examples that I compiled from my own history. My first do-it-yourself project was a CentOS 6 box on, running on a piece of hardware that was just barely better than a, um, than a server, or barely better than a desktop and I installed a Minecraft server on it. It was a great chance to learn Linux and then have some fun with my family. Once, uh, once my Minecraft server was up and running, that wasn't enough. I was hooked. I learned Nextcloud. I learned, uh, I bought some Unify networking equipment and they have a controller that runs on Linux. Um, let's see, you can host your own blog. Ghost is a great option. Uh, Linuxserver.io is a friend of the community and they have dozens and dozens of Docker containers. They have great tutorials and great ways to get started with tools like Plex, like Nextcloud, like Bitwarden. So any of these projects would be a great starting place. Find something, find a, a problem or a pain point in your life and find a technical solution for it and don't pay, don't pay a third party to do it for you. Do it yourself. I was able to save hundreds of dollars a year on Dropbox and Google Drive and all these other options because I started hosting Nextcloud at home. That instance has now moved from a Linux server to a Linux container and now is running on, on my co-located um, Dell server. Granted, the server was a little bit more than my Dropbox cost, but that's a topic for another day. <laughs> so one of the questions I get asked quite a bit is, what kind of education do I need? Well. <laughs> Forgive me, I may be a little bit cynical. I, I am the proud owner of a master's degree. It's gotten me nowhere. <laughs> so <laughs> I heard a couple of laughs. I think a few other people have heard this. So here's, here's the thing. You have to, you, you sh I won't say you have to. It's a great idea to get a degree. If you can get an associate's, a bachelor's, master's, whatever the case may be, if you have that piece of paper, you're going to get looked at. IT is one of the most competitive, one of the most cutthroat industries out there right now. Why? Because everything is run on computers today. You cannot brew your coffee in the morning, it seems like, anymore, without some kind of a computer. You can't start your car without the computer inside your car booting up. Computers are everywhere. It's, it's a tough industry to be in. So set, finding ways to set yourself apart is what's going to help you be successful. If you're looking to be an IT professional, I would recommend you get a degree. Don't do it to the point where it's crippling to your family or to your budget, but if you can afford it, go for it. There's assistance programs out there. That really helps. So if, if you don't have the time commitment, if you don't have the money, there's another alternative, and this one's probably better. Get certified. Find a certification that you like and go for it. There's a bunch of introductory uh, certifications that I highly recommend. There's the A+, there's the Linux+, Plus. Uh, Linux Foundation has uh, a number of certifications. So if you're just getting started, those are great, basic, just ground level foundational certifications that you can get that will help improve your marketability to, a, to an employer. Pro tip, number two, uh, Red Hat is very, very respected in this industry. Why? Because unlike all, most certifications, which are multiple choice, Red Hat certifications are hands-on. You literally walk in, they give you a broken VM, they say, here you go, and hand you a lab manual. So a lot of times, you have to reboot into emergency mode, reset the root password, and then boot back into, into, into the standard run level. And then you get to set up web servers, email servers, it varies from test to test. But in less than an hour, you can prove that you have the foundational skills to run a, a Linux server. It's, it's easy, it's fun to learn, and it's hands-on. For those of us that aren't great at test-taking, test I got my RCSA, I missed one question, because it was something that I was doing in my day job every single day. Go to where the puck is. I hate to say it, but Fortran, 
not around much anymore. Mainframes, they have a niche in, in, the, in, in, the, uh, in the industry. Maybe if you're just getting started, if, if you're just now in college, may not be a great way to go. I hate to tell I, I hate to I hate to tell my fellow veterans, but containerization, DevOps, that's where the puck is going. That's where everything is, is going to be running on. I, I deal there's not a day literally when I'm working with GitLab, talking on, on, from from a sales engineering perspective, there's not a day that goes by where I'm not talking about Kubernetes. So we have to get through the marketing hype. We have to ignore the buzzwords and actually look at what the technology is. So if you're taking notes, look at, look at cloud providers, look at AWS, look at GCP, look at Azure. Uh, that, 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 uh, uh, look at uh, AWS, GCP, and Azure. I'll, I'll withhold my personal commentary. <laughs> look at Docker, look at Kubernetes. I'm just gonna move on before I dig myself a deeper hole. Uh, look at tools like Prometheus. These are the tools moving forward that are going to be the staple of our industry. Tools like Nagios, tools like CentOS, all those still have their place. They're still very important, and I highly recommend you learn those tools. But if you want to, if you want to get ahead of the curve, there are more Kubernetes jobs out there right now than just about any other request in the industry, except maybe project management. So, here is the biggest issue getting involved with open source from a professional perspective. You get all this learning. You have a lab. You have, uh, maybe you were an intern somewhere. You've got a degree. You've got a certification. But you're waiting tables at, at uh, Waffle House across the street. Where do you go from there? The, the big pain point is that you have to have experience to get experience. <laughs> I mean, sadly, it's, it's a meme, but it's true. So here's, here's a couple of tips. Here's some things to look for. If you're not involved in the open source community, Start now. There are people all over this room and all over this conference that can help you get involved with a project, with a group of people, with a lug. Ask around. When you get home, look for internships. Look for help desk positions. Be a desktop technician. Look for a church or a not-for-profit who has a need and fill that need. Get something on paper. Get your foot in the door. That is your best option. For me, it was an internship working at my city municipality. So fast forward a few years, you're, you're working as, as a systems administrator, you're working on Windows and Linux, you, you really just want to work on Linux. Um, you, you've gone from help desk to desktop support to either systems or networking or database administrator, and, and you're looking at the next phase of your career. Look at a systems engineer position. Look at, uh, look at a systems architect position. The alternative, now here's a caveat. What they tell you when you're going through school, when you're getting involved in the industry, is there's two tracks in your career. You can either get really, really deep, so you're a systems engineer or you're a systems architect um, or an enterprise level systems architect, or you go into management. You get away from the technology entirely and you push papers and sit in meetings. That's what they tell you. I guarantee you later on in this talk, we'll talk about a whole bunch of other tracks. Tracks that were not made clear to me and cost me years of my career. So wait a minute. We've been talking about jobs. We've been talking about professional. This talk is about open source. So it was kind of a bait and switch. I, I, I admit it, I apologize. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. So a lot of this talk is derived from my own experience. I started out as a desktop technician intern. So I was using Norton Ghost. That takes a few of us back. I was using Norton Ghost to re-image desktops, and I was going through, and one of my major jobs each day was to work on our desktop refresh project. So we were taking old laptops and desktops, imaging new ones, dropping them off at the user's desk, copying their home folder, and hoping that everything worked. That's, that was about the first year of my career. After that internship was over, I got to go work at Quick Trip, which those of us that don't know the, the awesome news of, of Quick Trip, it is the best convenience store, hands down, come up here after the talk, I will argue you into the ground. Quick Trip's the best. <laughs> so from, so I graduated college, I left Quick Trip, started looking for a job. That was the hardest point in my entire life, 
trying to get my foot in the door. I had a bachelor's degree, I had a year's internship, had to try and find a job. I ended up as a application deployment person. I, I had a really awful title, but basically the developers would write code, would put it in a war file, and would send it over to me. I would then take that war file with no knowledge of Java and would deploy it to an application, and if it broke, I had to fix it. The developers would get to go home. I, I got to fix, try and fix their code. So after about a year and a half of that, I've, I kind of got back into my, my, my original plan. I became a systems administrator. I was working on Windows, doing a little bit of desktop support, and we had a couple of Linux servers that kind of did something special over here in the corner. We didn't really look at them or talk, at the, talk with them. Throughout college and, and through the early years of my career, I was on and off with Linux. I, I always had a special place, but it never quite was, was able to become my full-time job. So a few years into my career, I, I, I sat down, my... Uh, my girlfriend and I at the time went out to dinner and I just, I, my head wasn't there and I will not forget this night. I, I was talking to her about work and how frustrated I was and how miserable I was. And I was like, I, I just, I can't do this anymore. I, I, I like this Windows thing, but it's less than 10% of, of the servers that we run. I'm stuck in this Windows world, nothing wrong with Windows at the time, but it wasn't where, it wasn't where I was really excited. I really liked this Linux thing. So I made a hard choice. I found a job as a Linux systems administrator, just a, a sysadmin one, really, <laughs> really uh, uh, was getting, I, I took a pay, pay cut to switch jobs, but I didn't have to manage Windows anymore. I was able to go deeper with Linux. And so I, I moved over the next few years, I, I changed jobs once or twice and, and became more of a respected systems administrator. I kind of felt like I knew what I was doing. You know, when, uh, when I logged in, I wasn't looking at the, the black abyss, but it was a terminal and, and felt, uh, I felt comfortable there. But I still wasn't quite, I, I wasn't excited, I wasn't happy, I wasn't fulfilled with what I was doing. There was still something missing. So. <laughs> So, I mean, about six years apart, I had another one of those moments. And I will for not forget this night. I went down to my office. I had my monitor set up, my mouse and keyboard, on my Windows machine, running, running Chrome. How far I've come. <laughs> um, and I literally went to Google and typed in how to become a better systems administrator. And this is the moment that changed my entire life. This is six years into my career. All the, all the responses that came up were blogs to follow, recommendations for podcasts to listen to, suggestions for courses to take, do-it-yourself server projects. I came across this treasure trove of information that I had no idea was out there. I knew we used software. I knew that there wasn't, wasn't licenses, but I didn't understand that behind the software was an entire movement, and it, dozens and dozens and dozens of projects, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people working together, talking, developing software, coming up with new ideas, forking those ideas, coming up with better ideas. I had no idea, despite being in IT for so many years and working with Linux off and on that entire time, I had no idea that all this was out there. No one told me. When I was going through college, no one said that this was a thing. So I, what did I stumble upon? What, what did I stumble upon? What accelerated my career? It was the community. I came across the Linux Action Show. I came across this, this little podcast that some of us may know called Destination Linux. Um, I came across Linux Unplugged. I started to realize that there was communities around these podcasts. I started getting into Telegram groups. I found out that in Kansas City and Lawrence, Kansas, not too far from me, there was Linux user groups where people actually showed up with their laptops in person and talked about this stuff, talked about Linux, talked about how to get better. It was just an amazing epiphany, and I know some of you are out there rolling your eyes, but this was a big deal. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't have the opportunity to join an open source club in, in high school. That, that wasn't a thing where, where I grew up. And it really started to revolutionize my career. I spent hundreds of hours over the next few months digesting every piece of content I could look at. I spent more time... I spent more time listening to podcasts than most people were probably binge-watching. Well, Game of Thrones wasn't out by then. Whatever was popular seven years ago. <laughs> so I tell, you, I tell you my story not to brag, 
not, not to tell you that I'm better than you, but to tell you that I want the second half of this talk to help accelerate your careers. I want to help you all get, it, get involved in a community that really changed my life. I've got friends, some of which are sitting in this room, that I made through this community. People that I lean on, people that I trust, people that I talk to, not just for advice about technology, but about life. So, <laughs> I, I, I was searching memes on Google. I found that one, and it's like, yeah, that's, that's got to go in the talk. <laughs> I didn't expect it to derail my line of thought, but. <laughs> so, here's, I, I alluded to this in, in the, kind of the professional segment of this talk, but if you're going to work on something, you actually have to use it on a daily basis. Studies have shown that you have to have over 10,000 hours of experience with something before you can be considered proficient or, proficient or an expert. So if you're only using Linux for an hour or two at night, after you, you spend all day working at Waffle House, <laughs> then it's not going to really sink in. It's going to take a long time to get that proficiency level up. So instead, use the tools. Get another laptop, dual boot, virtual machine, whatever you have to do, start using those tools. Find the proprietary tools you use on a daily basis and swap them out for open source ones that you can actually install and use without paying a, a, a ransom fee. A lot of my tools were, were decided on based upon financial obligations. That's why Nextcloud was one of the first do-it-yourself projects I did. I was tired of paying, this, I was tired of paying someone else to store my data. So I brought it in-house, I started running Nextcloud. Not only was I learning open source, not only was I be becoming a better systems administrator and being a part of the community, I was actually saving money at the same time. So that was a, by saving on those subscription fees, I was actually able to start setting that money aside and buying better equipment, buying more equipment. Now I've got multiple tablets, multiple, multiple computers, multiple servers, it's, <laughs> it's a lot in, in our small studio apartment. <laughs> But the, the next thing, to the, the side note that I'll make on this is there's no one right tool. Find the tool that works best for you and use that tool and, and learn it. So if you're going to become a part of open source, you have to dive into the community. That means going where the community is. That can be on forums or issue boards. Find these projects and engage with them. Email the developer. Tell them that, hey, I came across your tool. I really like it. I've been using it for X, Y, Z. I really like what you're doing. Just interact. Get to know people. And then join Telegram groups. Join IRC groups. Yes, they're still a thing. <laughs> if, if you're involved with, if, if you're following Destination Linux or the Ask Noah show or... Um, or if you're, if you're a fan of UbiPorts, which is a, a mobile operating system that's, that's trying to compete with Android and iOS, if you're a part of these groups, they likely have a Telegram group that you can join and talk to people. And you know what? We don't, in, in some of those groups, I've been a member of, of, of those groups for almost four years, we don't just talk about what the project is. We talk about just about anything. But it gives us a chance, especially because most of us are, are probably introverts and, and don't interact well with large groups, it's a great chance in a safe environment to connect with people over a common thread. So if it's the Ask Noah show, we'll talk about the show. But that's only just a minute percentage of what we could actually talk about. Get involved. Get connected. And then be patient with yourself. Take a year just Absorb the community. Just learn. Just make connections. Meet people. Try different projects. And when you feel comfortable, start contributing back. That project that we talked about, that, that you reached out to the developer and said, hey, I've been using your tool. If, if, if that tool starts to not grow with your need, create an issue. Say, hey, I've got an idea. I'm, I'm not a developer, but I have this idea. I've got this feature. What do you think about doing adding XYZ to, to your project? It's called an enhancement request. If you come across a bug, if your application crashes while you're using it, go file a bug report. I don't know how many people will say that they're open source advocates, and then when you ask them how many bugs that they filed, they say, eh, I don't have time for that. That is one of the biggest problems that we need to solve as an open source community. We need 
to be contributing back. Create features, create bug requests. If you have something that crashes and you don't know how to file a bug report, email that same developer and go, hey, your application crashed. I'm not sure really what to do next. I want to help. I want to contribute back. And if you've got a good project, if it's a good, healthy community, they'll be open to that. They'll help walk you through collecting the, the appropriate logs and, and, and filling out more than this broke my computer. Instead, this application locked up my desktop and I had to reboot to fix the issue. If you can file a bug report, we can make improvements. We can't fix a problem that we don't know exists. If you're a developer, great. Find a project that needs a developer. If you're not, stay tuned. The next slide, I've got some tips for you. Because the open source community is growing, it's the development, um, the, the development cadence is getting faster and faster every day, and a lot of these projects are not as well staffed as it seems. I, I think back to when I was just a systems in, administrator, I thought all these applications were, were built by some multi-million dollar company that I just hadn't heard of. No, they, they, they don't just come out of thin air, they don't come from some company, it's a community effort. So think about, think about these two projects. A lot of us have met Simon. He is the release coordinator for an operating system um, variant called Ubuntu. It's an offshoot of Ubuntu. Last I checked, their team had two or three official members. An entire operating system is being maintained by two or three people and a small community of people that contribute back. Two to three people. It's a spin of Ubuntu. So let's, let's, let's zoom out a little bit. Open SSL. OpenSSL is a library that supports secure communications for web traffic. It, it handles thousands and thousands and thousands of web requests every day. OpenSSL is one of the most key libraries when it comes to internet traffic. Last I checked, you know how many people they had officially on their team? Ten. Don't you think that a project that is that pivotal to our industry, to our community, to our friends, our families, our, our businesses would have more than ten people? So, the common misconception I pointed out early on was that open source is about developers. That's a big piece of it, but that's not all of it. So, if you're not a developer, wake up, pinch yourself if you have to, and let's look at, let's look at the next few slides, and here's some ideas. If you're not a developer, great, that's not a problem. You know what you can do? You can learn Markdown. Markdown is a programming language for documentation. Okay, di uh, programming language may be a little heavy-handed. But Markdown is just basically a, a set of tags and symbols that get you certain, certain outputs. So I, I know it's kind of hard to read on the projector, but if you, if you look at the hashtag, that creates a header. If, uh, if you look farther down, there's an asterisk that creates a bulleted list. Anyone can go out there and find a Markdown cheat sheet and start writing Markdown. Documentation is pivotal. Coming up with, with text for, for blogs, for release notes, for, uh, for tutorials, all this stuff is very pivotal. In fact, I know of, I know of a gentleman who is a school teacher, I, th I think on the East Coast. He's a school teacher, um, and uh, he, he's got a predominant second language, I forget which it is, and he spends his evenings writing project documentation in his second language. I think it might be Japanese. Uh, but this gentleman spends a lot of time contributing to projects, writing documentation in a different language. It is a huge need, and it's one that's overlooked because open source is, quote, about developers. So you write some documentation, but you've got some other skills. Branding. Some of us went to, uh, some of us went to the talk yesterday about marketing do's and don'ts. Marketing is a huge need and a huge problem. We have so many name collisions. We have so many graphics and logos that look like they were made in the 1990s, because they were. <laughs> There's so much need to get clear marketing and clear branding around these projects. Some of these tools are some of the best we've ever seen, but no one's ever heard of them. Why? Because they're not properly promoted. So if you're a graphic designer, if you're good at marketing, if you're good at social media, find a project who needs that help. Find a project that you use, that you love, and help promote it. Help design them a new logo. Help, ref help give a new face to, to, their, to their website. It's a need, trust me. You don't have to look very far. 
In fact, the, the joke that was made yesterday was Red Hat. Their logo was over 20 years old, and they just now re redid it to look more modern. So maybe you've got a big mouth, like me, and you like to talk, you have ideas, and you like to share them. Great. Do so. Start a Linux users group. If there's not one in your town, join one. If there is one in your town, volunteer to give a talk. Find something in your past that you're excited about and share that information. Do a podcast. Um, do tutorials on YouTube. Some of the best tools that we have are not just the product documentation alone. I don't know how many times I've gotten used to a new product by looking at their YouTube tutorial and, and having their, their documentation side by side. Go to conferences, check. So if you're taking notes, give yourself a check mark. You've already got a step done, great job. <laughs> and yes, there, there is a financial need. Some of these projects only have two or three people, and they really would like to dedicate their full effort to their projects. Some of them are very passionate. Some of them live below the poverty level because they are so passionate about their project. Find a way to give back. There's tools out there. And projects are getting better. We're working on this in, in the community. Projects are getting better about actually, projects are getting better about actually having donate, donation links on their pages. We're still, we, there's still so many more valuable projects out there that could use a hand, that could get new life breathed into them if the, develop, if the core developers weren't so dependent upon outside, um, outside jobs, outside uh, responsibilities. I don't know how many developers I talk to are trying to make ends meet by doing Uber Eats runs and then developing their application afterwards. Go to Patreon, go to LibrePay, go to GoFundMe. These tools have projects listed on them that you can donate back to. It doesn't have to be a ton of money, but if everybody goes out and picks one project and donates $5 a month, I mean, just with the number of people in this room, we could make a huge difference for the price of one latte a month. Then there's tools like Elementary OS. They recently, well, recently, it's been a couple of years, but a couple of years ago, they started this interesting initiative to where if you download an application out of their store, you get an option to donate to that product, uh, to that project. You get prompted to, you can put in zero or you can put in a value. You can, I, th I think they've even added functionality to add in a recurring donation. But this is just a small way. How many of us go on and, and download some, some game that's a clone of six other games that we've played and we'll drop $4.99 on that game and not give it a second thought? But then we go and download a, a note-taking application that we use every single day for home, for our job, for our shopping list, for our kids' birthday present list. And we look at that and go, I'm not donating to that. A little bit goes a long way. So one of the other things that I would tell you is to take opportunities as they come. Be patient. This community gets burned all the time. People will come in, will stir up this big fuss. They're entitled because they're used to paying for software and getting an enterprise-grade application. That's not open source. That's not how this works. This is a community. It's an, it, it's an initiative. It's a, it's a movement. So you can't come in and just expect that everything's going to be handed to you on a silver platter. That's what Mac OS is for. That's how Apple makes their money. They, they sell you at an exorbitant amount and, and experience. What's great, about, what's great about the open source community in Linux, you get to build your own. And what does that give you? Why is that important? You, you get more value. You feel more connected to the tools you're, you're using. You get connected to a brilliant group of people. You, you can either use a tool or you can be a part of something. But it, it takes time to make connections, to earn trust. You're not just going to show up day one and be handed a project. Well, you might. <laughs> we need the help. But, uh, but be patient. Try different roles. Be a release coordinator for a project. Be a social media coordinator for a, for a different project after a while. Try your hand at development. There's, there are first-time first committer uh, tags on a lot of projects that are, are bugs that, that the developer feels like should be fairly easy to fix. These are great low-hanging fruit to go out and try, try your hand at a project. Trust me, the first time you make a pull request, it's kind of nerve-wracking. And you sit there and refresh the page over and over and over again, wondering if the developer is looking at your, at your request and your code change going, where did this guy learn to code, Fisher-Price? So, <laughs> it takes time. 
I've been on my journey, I've been on my open source journey for over four years now. I spent about a year and a half just learning, trying out different distros, hopping from one to the other, absorbing podcasts, meeting people. And it really started to change my career because after a few years as a systems administrator, I had the connections and the interest um, in the community to, to change my career. I, I realized that I was missing the people aspect. And now I'm, I'm working at GitLab. And this isn't, this isn't a sales pitch for GitLab. I'm not going to ask you to take your wallets out. I've been accused of that before. So disclaimer, this is not a sales pitch. This is me talking from my heart. So I, I'm, I'm working for GitLab now as a solutions architect. And a lot of what my job entails is getting to know customers. I, I work in the mid-market space. So you know, let's figure 1,000 people in, in a company or so. And so I'm, I, I get to meet customers. I get to talk to them about their infrastructure. I get to talk to them about their application, what they're trying to do. I get to connect with them on a human level and learn what they're passionate about and go, hey, that's really cool. I would love to see that. I've got, I've got this tool that I would love to talk to you about. Yeah, it's going to cost your company some money, but it's going to be worth it because it's going to fix your work-life balance. It's going to help your company iterate faster. It's going to help you make changes. And that... I cannot tell you, and the reason why I got this talk and why I was really excited when it was, when it was accepted is because this is so near and dear to my heart because I just went through this over the past five years. I'm getting to live this now, and so can all of you. I, I get to connect customers. I get to, I get to change the way they do business. I get to change their lives in a way because I don't know if there's any other systems administrators out there, but I cannot tell you how many sleepless nights I've had because I've get, I get that phone call at 2 a.m., to fix some server that no one cares about but has to be up by 8 a.m. On, on Monday morning because it's not being well taken care of. That leads to burnout. That leads to sleepless nights. That leads to families being torn apart. That leads to people missing events with their kids. We in this community, with our technology, with our community, with the people in this group, we can change things. I cannot tell you how much my life has changed because of the avalanche of changes that have come with becoming part of this community. I've lost a ton of weight. I'm in better shape. I'm learning new technologies. I'm in a position that's not only engaging me technically, but also socially. So I'm feeling better. I'm more confident than I've ever been. All because I got it plugged in to the fullest extent of what I can do with this community. So if you've been in IT for a while or if you've been in the community for a while and, and you sat through this talk, thank you very much. I, I hope that this, this has given you an idea of something you're not doing. But I do have a word of warning. There's a lot of folks coming into, the, into, into open source. There are a lot of new faces. There are so many people that have been burned by Windows. There are so many people that it can't afford to replace their entire line of Mac hardware. <laughs> There, there are people out there that are realizing that this community exists. There are people that are realizing that there's so much freedom and protection of data and personal privacy and so many advantages to being a part of our, of our community. If you're a veteran, I would ask you, don't be a jerk. I would beg you, don't rage on people on Telegram or on IRC just because you're, you're this... this ambiguous figure that, that's just a username on a website. I cannot tell you how many developers I've heard over the past few years walk away because they're tired of all the garbage. I cannot tell you how many people tried Linux for a few weeks, tried open source for a few weeks, and then went right back to whatever platform they were on because the community was harsh. Now, don't get me wrong. For the most part, people that are entering this community have had a great experience, but some people haven't, and we'll probably never see them come into our lugs again. So if you, if you are a veteran, remember that you were once new to this community too. Remember that one time, you didn't know how to make a pull request. RTFM is not an acceptable answer. Help walk them through that process. RTFM only makes people more angry. Instead, help them see how to fix their issue and then walk them through how they could have troubleshooted it themselves. I cannot tell you how, many, how frustrating it is to go and, and look at Stack Exchange and try and learn what someone else did only to realize that that post was actually from five years ago and the libraries that are supporting the application aren't even the same anymore. Sometimes you just need a hand. Sometimes you just need someone to walk you through the process once or twice and then guess what? You've given them a better experience 
you've fixed their problem, you've eased their pain, and if that happens a couple of times, then they're going to go out and do the exact same thing. That's why I'm on the stage, because people in this community, people like Noah Chalaya, people like, like Rocco and Zeb, who, are, who are, are here to throw tomatoes at me at, at the Q&A session, people like that were there in my corner when I was new to this community. So if we can do the same for 100 more people, and we fill this room up next year when we revisit this talk, because new people have come in, new people want to be a part of this community, our community is going to grow. We're not going to lose valuable projects and pro valuable developers to burnout and to personal depression or personal loss because we are there to help build a better community. Um, now, I know I kind of got into my conclusion, but I, I did have a minor note. The distro wars, by the way, are over. The desktop wars, they're over. I hate to tell you, GNOME and Plasma, they actually work together. They have a conference every year now where they collaborate on ideas. So that was kind of part of the RTFM part. But uh, help new people come in. Find someone to mentor you, and then find someone to mentor. Use the buddy system. Use these communities. Let's build a better... Oh my gosh, I almost said, let's build a better tomorrow. I will not be that cliched. I, I take that statement back. Let's rewind the video, and I'm not going to say that. <laughs> I think on that note, I'm just going to move to the next slide. <laughs> but, but seriously, the cliches and, and, the, and the personal soapbox aside, we're better together as a community. Companies that build these walls, walled gardens are in for a rude awakening. The open source community is where it's at. So, because I like to practice what I preach, I'm, I'm, I ran and built this presentation on my System76 Galago Pro. It's using Arch Linux, by the way. <laughs> I'm using LibreOffice, Firefox, and GitLab to manage distributing this, these slides. So I, I'm not standing up here with a MacBook or an iPad. So I wouldn't stand up here and tell you, and, and tell you that uh, you should use Linux while I'm, while I'm using an iPad. In fact, my talk is open source. This is something I want to share with people. And if anyone in this room found it valuable, go, go to my GitLab repo, download this talk, and look through the slides, because I've listed out a lot of the tools that I talked about. Tools like DigitalOcean, tools like Linux Academy, tools like Telegram IRC groups, podcasts. And I would like to iterate on this. I would like this talk to be given all over the place by as many people as possible. Because I feel like this is a foundational, a foundational topic that people just assume people know. Maybe it's just me. I didn't. It took me seven years into my career before I finally figured out that there was more to my career than just the servers that were in the, in the server closet behind me. I welcome your feedback. This is open source. Please give me feedback, make changes, help me improve this. I'm trying to give this talk a few other places. So if you can give me your feedback, how to make it better, how to, how to uh, at least not make it worse. <laughs> if there's resources I forgot about, if there's do DIY projects that I didn't think of, please, please, please send, send me feedback. So I thank you very, very much for your time. We've got... Um, We've got about 12 minutes or so. I would welcome any questions or conversation that you might have. Lab. Yes, sir. GitLab. No. No, GitLab is, is completely independent. Um, we're planning on IPOing next year. Um, we were developed by a, a couple of folks who were, were uh, remote. And uh, they actually came together because GitLab was originally just a self-hosted Git repository. It was open sourced. And because it was a great project, it attracted more people to it. And then after about two or three years of just being an open source project, they formed a company around it because the, uh, the lead developers kind of wanted to eat. So they formed a company. They started selling uh, installation services and uh, then expanded to a support model similar to Red Hat, but their application worked really, really well, so people would use support once or twice and then never again. Um, and so now GitLab is an open core model where about 90% of the code base is open source. Uh, the other 10% are paid premium features um, and includes 24-hour uh, support and, and different levels of, of, uh, 
of um, features on either GitLab.com, which is a SaaS solution, or on, on a self-hosted uh, self instance. So GitLab's completely independent. Um, it's, a single, it's a single tool for, uh, for the entire DevOps lifecycle. So instead of managing GitHub, Jira, Jenkins, SonarCube, and however many other products I'm, I'm not thinking of off the top of my head, you can install GitLab, and it's one interface, it's one tool to, to handle all of that. So not trying to sell anything. I'm not asking for your wallets. But yeah, GitLab is completely independent of, of GitHub. They're, they're actually a competitor of ours. GitLab is 100% remote. We don't have an office. <laughs> I'm based out of Kansas City. There's two or three people from uh, Charlotte. There's actually two other people uh, here from GitLab, uh, and they've both given talks. Um, but uh, yeah, global and six, almost 60 companies or 60 countries. But I'd be more than happy to talk about GitLab uh, after afterwards. Any, any other questions or comments or feedback, please? I know I, know I threw a lot of information at you, and I, I, I really, really sincerely hope it was valuable. Yes, sir. OK, so the question was, we talked about uh, tools for learning. Um, and the question was, is, is there anything I would recommend specifically for Kubernetes? Um, yes. Um, Linux Academy has a number of great tools. And then there is a site that actually does walkthroughs. Um, I know Red Hat has a bunch of stuff. I know OpenShift's on there. Uh, but Kubernetes also has one. Um, I could probably look it up really quick with a Google search, but it's, it's not coming to me. You, on, on one side, it basically gives you step by step uh, what you're doing and gives you the exact command. And then on the right is a live terminal. Um, that's, so you can basically copy and paste the commands and step through the process one at a time. And it's, it's very succinct. It's a great way to just get in and get started. But the name is, is escaping me right now. Um, come up uh, after we're done, and I, I will Google search that for you real quick. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, that's that's great. Uh, that's that's great feedback. So the the idea was, if you want to learn Markdown and you still want a DIY project to host yourself, there's Cody M MD, right? Yeah. There's Cody MD. You can go down. You can go online, search Cody MD. It's it's a Markdown editor. It's basically an online notebook. Um, it's open source. It's it's got a Docker container. It's it's. I haven't used it myself, but I've I've talked to a lot of people, and I'm, I I need to give it a try. Uh, but great feedback. In fact, I might try and add that one into into the talk as well. Uh, any other any other questions or feedback? Cody MD. It's K O D I. Oh, C O D I. Yeah, K O D I is is a media media server. So C O D I M D. Rocco. OK, um, so the question was, are, are there more local resources that you can make use of? Um, are, are you talking about from, from an employment perspective or from, OK, so employment. Um, so, so the question was, uh, what other resources would you suggest looking for uh, for employment resources? Um, so for getting started, I would recommend looking for internships. Um, a lot of times colleges will have, will have uh, bulletin boards, or sometimes they even have their own, their own staff. Um, some other things you might consider are job boards. Um, I don't think Craigslist really does that anymore. Um, but then there's things like um, there's careerbuilder.com, there's monster.com, so your, your traditional job boards. Um, I don't really recommend going the recruiter route, but sometimes, sometimes you need to know somebody who knows people to, to kind of get connected and, and start building your own network. Um, so job boards, local recruiters, um, Going to local schools, um, and sometimes sometimes they have interns. Sometimes they're just looking for help. Um, not for profits or not for profits, charities, churches. Those are those are great options um, because those are usually people that don't have a lot of lot of budget to spend, and so they're all usually looking for volunteers. And it's usually kind of an accepted thing that if you're volunteering your time, then they kind of take your your 
expertise with a grain of salt. So if they're if you're just an intern for them, they're not going to expect you to build a ten thousand uh, dollar infrastructure overnight. <laughs> um, but if the, that's kind of the the list that I I had in my notes. Um, if anyone else has any recommendations of where they found a job or uh, where they've they found a, a starter job, um, I would love to hear it because, like I said, that's something I'd like to include in the talk going forward. Question in the back. Okay, yeah, that's that's a great feedback. So, so the feedback was um, that this gentleman started a job, working, uh, in, in with the safety team and basically doing jobs that weren't IT related. But he he got some time in with the company, and he showed himself to be a dependable employee. And and as his as his time has gone on, he has uh, been able to move into the IT department within that same company. And that's that's great. That's a great situation. That, that's a great approach, and I, I, that didn't even occur to me. Right. So Tyler up here in front uh, works for Amazon. He started out in the warehouse. He does more IT support now. Um, so that's a great option. So if you're not working in IT right now, but you've been learning it and you enjoy it, talk to your existing employer. See if they have any needs. Most companies would love to hire internally and do a transfer to a different apartment, then have to go out onto the street and find somebody completely new. Yes, sir. As far as that first IT job, so many people have gone to like broadband providers or Verizon Fire through local cable company. And it's not the most desirable job, but like most of us have gone through that path and then gone to network and folks training. Like just like you know, envy, you know, just ask like answer questions from residential end users. You know, I can't move my house. And how do I get Netflix to go on? Right, that, that's amazing feedback. So, so his point was, and, and just mostly for, this, for the stream and, and the recording, but his point was that a lot of people that you see that are very successful in IT, they started out as, as what I'd call a data center monkey. <laughs> so this is a person who carries a server, throws it in the rack, plugs in the cables, hit power, and then they go, go back to their desk, they close out their ticket, and then the systems engineer actually takes the work, ta takes the, the ticket, and builds out the server and that kind of thing. So you start out racking and stacking servers. Um, a lot of my first jobs involved cleaning out the data center, which, was, which other people thought was a closet. Um, so, so working for telcos and co-locations um, are usually a great way to get introduced to the environment. It's a great way to see if it's something that you'll enjoy. Um, it's a great way to learn from, from, from professionals, people that have just a little bit more experience than you. So uh, data centers, co-location, uh, uh, co-location locations, <laughs> and, um, and, and telcos, colos. <laughs> Um, so yeah, great, great feedback. That's not something I considered. Um, so I've got about a minute. So any other, any other last minute thoughts? Okay, everyone. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for your attention and for your time. And and go out and and you know, let's let's continue building this community. Thank you so much. Thank you.